thank you very much for the invitation again to this lovely uh, location and nice summer school. Um, so yes, so it's wonderful. I, I, I meanwhile being here also working quite closely on setting up a, a comprehensive care center. So that, that's basically what I do. So I look at policies, I help governments, authorities, healthcare organizations, university, etc. how to uh, make the connection between the policy level and actually implementation. And often digital is, is part of that. Um, so I will talk a little bit about uh, some issues uh, from a governance policy perspective in relation to healthcare transformation, change uh, and digital. Yes, yeah, so I, I work across the globe uh, on different continents, except Africa, I'm, I'm not so active. Uh, but yeah, favelas in Brazil, for example, on how to community care in typical difficult environments work. I've worked in Iran on uh, maternity care, uh, Russia. Uh, so, uh, and I use these sort of experience to also for, for other systems on how they might tackle some issues, also social, cultural uh, issues. Um, yeah, and doing this work partly in connection to WHO uh, on, uh, let's say, improvement programs, uh, but also European Commission, sometimes more on the research innovation part and sometimes more on programs for collaboration from the Union, for example, with uh, post-Soviet uh, republics like Georgia, Armenia, and Moldova. Um, yes, yeah, so globally, governments are really struggling with big issues in health and social care. And of course, they differ among the different countries, uh, but uh, they have a lot in common. And already what has been uh, said by, by others, uh, part of that is an aging society. So, so most societies are aging with a huge impact on demand of care, rising demand of care, uh, lesser resources, uh, economies are contracting, um, and that creates instability in healthcare systems. Um, and on top of that, despite this sort of gradual growing uh, challenges, we have instantaneous uh, crises, uh, such as COVID pandemic, but already uh, before, not in this region, but in some other regions, SARS and MERS. Uh, so they're happening. And even flu is uh, a problem. Uh, if you look to the UK, uh, the debate in the UK uh, today uh, and the last week is also about preparing for the flu. Uh, because a lot of elderly people end up in the hospital. Uh, beds are, are not available, so you get queuing of ambulances outside the hospital, uh, people can go to home and dis uh, after discharge because there's no uh, sufficient capacity in social care. So um, that, that is something which is coming on top. So it's, it comes together as a sort of uh, perfect storm. But you can also see a lot of the problems were uh, already uh, forecasted. It's, it's no prediction. These are the things which we are already told about 15 years ago. Reports, Netherlands, we, we had the word different authorities indicating the risk for an outbreak of the pandemic, the risk of a very efficient system, and that you have no let a surplus available for taking care if there really a crisis happening. Despite that, policymakers didn't invest. Uh, they took all, uh, no vision, no, no action plan or whatever. And, and the same applies to the US, same applies to the UK. Most developed countries didn't prepare. So it tells you something. Evidence is not usually something uh, policymakers will listen to. Uh, they might do different things. Um, and therefore, it's important that, I, uh, that people like you, researchers, other sort of civil society organizations raise uh, the importance of these kind of things. And, um, mobilized to get yourself heard. Um, already for, for three decades, we know, okay, we should shift from institutionalized hospital-oriented care, which is illustrated by the um, left-hand side, in most systems across the globe, 
very focusing on hospital care, often monodisciplinary oriented and not so much involvement of local care or community, let's say, networks in order to provide a more integrated um, a collaborative approach on how to deal with health issues, not only with medical issues, um, that, but that we should move to the right-hand side. Uh, still, we need specialized high-tech care, uh, but we have to move more to the community level, offering a broad range of services, not only medical, but also social, mental health support, prevention, typically it's not happening in hospitals, it's, it's happening in the community. And also a strong connection with, with the population, with the people, in order to make this uh, happen. Although we have plenty of evidence, we invested millions, billions in doing research on this type of approaches, still it's hardly happening. Also in developed systems like the US, like the Netherlands, etc, uh, etc. Et so, again, Evidence and research doesn't necessarily change the mind or improve implementation. Um, and partly of the, the problem is that care is fragmented. So if you want to improve health outcomes of people, it, it's not depending on the tar targeted molecule or the device or the wonderful surgeon or the wonderful GP alone. It's a total process over time. Uh, usually, well, the, the very simple things, uh, they can be solved quite simply. But if you're dealing with more complex issues, uh, uh, like mentioned comorbidities and usually aging come with uh, multiple problems, including social and mental issues, you have a journey with different patient needs who might fluctuate over time. And actually you need uh, that the system reacts dynamically in a very uh, personalized approach. This is already very, very difficult for systems because systems, they tend to be fragmented, not coordinated, not patient-centered, usually. And so this coordinated team approach, this will deliver the outcomes. Accordingly, if you are specifically focusing on one sort of technology or a targeted molecule, it won't save the world or will not improve health per se. Uh, so you need to think about the whole process and that makes it so difficult. Because if you want to make digital work or precision medicine, you have to change the system, you have to improve the system. So that are some of the concerns and that we are not really effective to make it happen. So, um, there are some challenges. So main challenges, it's about cost containment for policymakers and the kind of impact you can make. So I give you some examples on the paradoxes in healthcare. So, okay, we should be more focusing on prevention. And typically the sort of one aspect of prevention is that we look at early signs of diseases and whether we can anticipate them with early interventions. Um, so one way to look at it is to have uh, early diagnosis and early treatment. So typically medtech, pharma, digital health or, uh, industries are, are developing products like biomarkers and that, that kind of, uh, of stuff. And to avoid uh, that people end up late and, and the system reacts uh, when the problems are already there, which, which makes sense. And for some groups, this uh, might work. But the problem with the phenomenon of early detection and prevention is that you have usually new technologies developed. Uh, that uh, the problem with, if you start with uh, population screening and early detection and diagnosis, uh, that there's always an element of overdiagnosis. So people get diagnosed, uh, and, and, uh, but, but not um, uh, had they having the disease. And so there is a tendency of medicalization. Uh, because it's always not very clear, okay, is this, is this real? Should we look further? The problem with diagnosis approaches is that it generates more diagnostic instruments. And typically people end up in the system 
in an, in an whole thread mill of diagnosis and they always find something which is suspicious. It is a business model for many hospitals. The Mayo Clinics, the Cleveland Clinics in the US, they are they heavily uh, uh, depending on these type of approaches. We can do anything, uh, whole body scans. Y yes, we can take you to genome. Oh, maybe a family member might also be um, susceptible for some developing diseases and so on. And of course, this is an industry business model. So the paradox is rather than you filter out those who you might early treat, well, there might be a portion, you also have a lot of people which are uh, uh, not properly diagnosed, they get into this meal, uh, they get over-treated, and they get all kinds of side effects. The problem is, the money you have to invest in this process, not only for the development, but also in, in the use to make the system running with uh, treatment and therapy, is that uh, it costs resources. Resources which you cannot allocate to those who really need care or to other areas like um, just do being more active or, or a healthy diet, which is usually much more uh, cost effective and much more cheaper. If you uh, uh, do this kind of thing, then the, let's say the biomedical approach. So overall, poorer outcomes. Yeah, that's, that's strange, yeah? but f at a system level, if you look at the system level on the use of technologies, on how uh, healthcare system how healthcare system performs, it's it's very different. And and one of the illustrations of a bad performing healthcare system, uh, but uh, where there's a great business, is the U.S. Fifty percent of the U.S. people don't have access to the most basic healthcare, like dental, like a family doctor. And still, it's the most expensive uh, healthcare system in the world. So this become a uh, real economic issue for the whole country, not only for healthcare, but also for other. So one explanation. So th these are sort of the uh, dilemmas you have, where to invest in to make people healthier and happier. There's another thing which is uh, quite interesting, is that we have this startup movement. And uh, so we have all kind of uh, startups active. There is financing for, uh, from the uh, commission, for example, but also a lot of investors in startups. If you look in what they deliver, uh, both in uh, how to access, uh, how many access the market, but also how they really contribute in terms of real change for patient, it's, it's not really much, hardly any. Also in the Netherlands, startups hardly reach the market. And if so, often the, the, the change is, is relatively low. But it's an investor model. It's just an investment model to generate revenue if you insert in a startup. Because others will do so. And yeah, the first one is getting the real benefit, while the late investors not. Well, this whole business model I'm not going to elaborate. So there's a lot of hype. And the hype itself generates money for uh, investors rather than improving healthcare systems. So also this is not a very efficient way how to innovate your healthcare system. So this is also a dilemma. So in general, not all technology or innovation, but the majority of the technology innovations only increase healthcare expenditure. So we, uh, 2018, we made a historical data study and projections for the future, healthcare spending in the Netherlands, um, and so partly the cost projection is explained by aging, uh, but two-thirds of the doubled increase for 2030 is explained by new technologies and treatments, etc. And, and not so much improving health uh, outcomes. So this raises some questions. How are we going to deal with this? Um, so, uh, Sabato, thank you very much. Uh, also for your presentation before mine, because one way to control it is legislation and regulation. And uh, the European Commission, uh, Commission imposed new regulations for medical devices, in vitro devices, but also think about the AI Act. Uh, so they are means for governments uh, to control costs, to improve safety and quality for people. So the existing uh, legislation was very linear, 
that means okay there's a process towards the market and the uptake and then yeah often the monitoring afterwards the use and, and possible problems with use were not so much uh, moderate so they changed the new legislation into a cyclic model uh, so that uh, the connection between the use and and maybe the good things or the bad things is feeding back into the process of innovation and development. Also the, the, uh, the participation of the end users in the process was also uh, part of the uh, aim. So we have now this cyclic process uh, where at this side you have the sort of policy controls. Um, so you have the the innovation, the, the process of development, then the validation process, typically a um, health technology assessment process, access to the market and all kind of evidence you should deliver in the process. And so that, that is one part. Um, when it comes to market access, when something is approved that has to access the market, this is also a point where policymakers could uh, describe criteria uh, on gate control, what actually will be embarrassed or not based on uh, the demands of a given country or a region. Uh, so that's, that's another element for control. Um, um, on the procurement side, whether it's a healthcare provider level or more a country's level, you can also do in sort of setting prices, negotiations, adding criteria on performance of the device or the service usually it's a combination um, and then it goes into use and you monitor better uh, the process and this this new legislation was also because uh, there were so many issues with medical devices uh, safety issues performance issues um, so th that's that's a way how to control from a government perspective just to give you an example um, so when it comes to um, rolling out transformation and strategies. Uh, so, of course, uh, there, there are multiple strategies across the globe uh, uh, on more person-centered care, the use of digital. Um, and actually, it's, it's, it's usually not so very successful. And because it's so complex, if you want to implement digital, it's, it's usually not about the digital tools. It's usually about redesigning the service. So uh, the digital should come with change on how you organize uh, healthcare. And, and that's a more difficult part. Um, so there are some lessons learned. Uh, so we, we made a study on, on how well countries are prepared for transformation. And the Netherlands is pretty high. So we have, we have the money. We have the expertise, we have wonderful hospitals with all these fancy IT systems, etc. research, wonderful. Only one problem, if, if a hospital wants to send patient information, simple from an, to another hospital or maybe to a primary care professional or to social care, we do it by fax. <laughs> so that tells you something about this wonderful research in the Netherlands. So, it means, okay, so all these rankings on how well countries are performing don't necessarily mean that they are really effective in providing healthcare for people. And so and there's a lot of boasting from all these countries like, okay, we are the best on research, biomedical. Uh, the, 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 the paradox is that we have wonderful research, we have wonderful uh, uh, infrastructures for research, but simple things like patient communication or between professionals, it's with the facts. Uh, so that tells you something about the status in the Netherlands on, on really getting this uh, healthcare transformation uh, done for all kinds of reasons. So what we know from digital strategies, but also for, in general for healthcare transformation strategies, of course there are certain builder blocks which you need to have in place. Uh, so you should have some sort of infrastructure which facilitates uh, information among professionals, from professionals to uh, the patients, maybe with, with some app. Usually, uh, because of to tackle fragmentation, you need standards and interoperability. Um, 
uh, of course, proper services, applications, so etc. Uh, proper uh, policy and legislation, uh, workforce, you need maybe some investments, and this has to be translated in a vision. How do you envision healthcare? Uh, so there are principle, uh, guiding principles, values are important, uh, because usually uh, countries, uh, the healthcare system is reflecting a country's values and how it translates into support of, of people. So the strategy uh, defines, okay, what, what should be done? How do we reach the targets and uh, have the main objective? And it should be a concrete action plan. Okay, who does what, when, on the particular things, and what is the sort of uh, coherence? So th this is typically what should be done. And many uh, countries do have that available. Uh, but then it comes, okay, how do we put in practice? How do we engage people? Uh, and how we can uh, set up a collaborative infrastructure to work on it? Uh, as you, you also heard a little bit in the last days. So user needs are central. If we really me, uh, uh, taking this very serious, this patient-centered approach, there's a co-creation process in which uh, people have to be engaged, uh, have to understand the user needs. And these are very strong, uh, powerful tools to understand the needs by every stakeholder and to rethink the type of services uh, to improve healthcare. So typically, you need a local context, regional context, to understand the local, let's say, uh, context sensitivities, uh, opportunities and, and hurdles. And you need to build an integrated solution, partly built on the needs, but also looking at the health professionals, how they work, how they should change, uh, whether there's technology available or data or not, what, what should be done, uh, where you can capitalize on. So it's a very process sort of approach on how you develop this. But it also indicates to this, you need a sort of multi-level approach. So at the individual disease area level, very crucial is the local uh, context, the family context, the social context, might also include employers, specific neighborhoods. If you look to one neighborhood in Bologna or the city center, healthy, rich, etc. So it might uh, be very different. Uh, so you need this sort of multi-level approach, which also indicates, uh, so it makes very much sense, but it's not always very easy. There are all kinds of tools available but already translate this in a sort of proper uh, concrete strategy is, can be a problem for, for countries. So uh, fortunately, we are in the EU. And I should say that the European Commission also have programs, tools, etc. available. Again, you need a sort of infrastructure and approach locally uh, available, expertise to guiding the process. You have to focus on services, on technology integration, but also on the, the financial uh, aspects. And we need, and there are also programs to facilitate this process from the Commission, hopefully on the national level, in Ita Italy it is, we're there for example, regional approaches and also a process for upscaling and uh, learnings uh, among each other. So, uh, usually a structure you have uh, ideally a sort of public-private approach, I think, because we need the industry and, and industry is doing, trying to also do, do a good job, but also for them it's, it's, it's not always very uh, new. Oh, it, it is new, it's, uh, it's also they are learning on how to find proper business models and it's, you come to a level of regions and regions to localities where actually the sort of change should be happen. So it doesn't happen from a desk somewhere in an office of an authority. It really, you have to think about how could this work with the local people. So that points a little bit to the challenges, but we really make a process, progress. And uh, also in Italy, uh, you have these regions, and really now this, uh, there is a movement in uh, making this, uh, this happen. And this in many countries. So if you also look to Central Eastern Europe, Romania, Slovakia, uh, Serbia, uh, Moldova, I, I really get enthusiastic about the sort of ambition people have about how to rethink uh, the often scarce resources. Um, 
So I, I think that's hopeful. And, but it's also really depending on you type of people to move this forward, uh, to, to be the critical thinkers, but also on the constructive dialogue, okay, where should we move? The current governments often are, are, are not the guys who are going to make it. The industry, despite all their promises, it's often not uh, what, they, what they deliver. They have different interests. So we have to find a sort of balance in which you play a critical role. It's, it's your future eventually. Um, so I, I hope I gave you a very broad overview. Uh, a bit superficial maybe, but uh, yeah, I hope it will work for you for the mindset. Thank you very much.